This lecture is over chapter 6 from the Think Python book about fruitful functions. Now many of the functions that we have used in Python produce return values, but we haven't written any that have a return value. They've all been what are known as void. They may have an effect, like we printed a value or we moved a turtle, but they don't actually return a value. This chapter is about writing functions that are fruitful and will return a value. The book gives you examples that are very math-based here. I'm going to switch over to this version that will give us a couple of business applications to complement what's in the textbook. So go ahead and read the other one and then check this one out, these examples out as well, and maybe they'll be more helpful to you. Return values. They're just a value that is assigned to a variable or used in expression that is returned by a function. So here's our first example. We're defining a cash flow function. It is going to have two variables or parameters, income and expenses. So you will input an income and an expense into this function. It will then calculate the cash flow, which is a simple subtraction. So if I run that, and then I am going to assign $10,000 and $9,000. So $10,000 for income, $9,000 for expenses, and that will calculate the cash flow I have left of $1,000. Now we may have seen the return statement before, but here we're making it actually return an expression. So re what return means is return immediately from this function and use the following expression as return value. We could write our cash flow more concisely here. Instead of having the CF variable, we could just say return income less expenses for our cash flow, and it will have the same impact. It's just a more concise version. Now, as you write larger functions, you may want to use what is known as incremental development because you're going to find yourself doing a lot of debugging. And if you use this incremental development process, it makes debugging easier. Let's look at this example. Suppose you want to calculate compound interest. In this example, compound interest refers to calculating the compounded interest, not just the interest gained on the principal invested or on a borrowed amount. And we have our formula A equals P times inside of parentheses, 1 plus r over n, close parentheses, to the power of nt. And you can see a stands for new principal, p for the original principal amount, r for the annual nominal interest rate, this is a float variable, overall time, length of time for the interest is applied is t, and n for compounding frequency, how often a year or whatever the period is. So the first step that we want to do is consider the function itself. What should it look like? So what kind of variables or parameters should be going in, passed in, and what's going to be returned out? In this case, we need four input variables. We need the principal and interest. So we need the original principal amount, the nominal interest rate, the time, and the compounding frequency. So we're going to need those four things. The return value is going to be that accrued amount, principal plus interest, and the total compound interest. So let's set it up this way. We're going to write our an outline. So we're defining the compound interest function. It has these four variables, principal, rate, n, and t and we're going to initially just return zero. So if we use this, all it's going to do is make sure we've got our syntax correct. Returns nothing. And if we were to put in, say, principal amount of $5,000, an interest rate of 8% with four compounding periods or compounding times over a two-year period, it would still return zero because we have nothing in there. Next, we would start figuring out some of the components, so some of the subvalues. 
So if you go back and look at our formula, let's go with what's inside of the, of the parentheses first. We're going to call that r over r underscore n. It's going to be equal to 1 plus the rate divided by n. And we want that division to happen first, of course. And that's going to get r n or our compound rate. So we're going to make that calculation. And then we're going to print out the results. Next, we're going to calculate n t, which is what we're taking this to the power of right here. So we're going to put that in. nt is equal to n times t. And that's our frequency. So we're going to print out frequency as nt and return 0. Now, if we use this, it should, with these values, give us these results, compound rate and frequency. Then we're ready to move on and finish it off. So now we've got r underscore n and nt. So our final result is the principal times r n, r underscore n to the power of nt. And we want to return the result rounded to 2. So let's work through that down here. What happens when we do this? Well, we've got it set up. Let's go ahead and to this, let's add compound. Let's go ahead and use our new function. 5,000, 0.08 for 8%, 4, and 2. And let's run that. And we get a return of 0, which is what we expected. Now, here, We've put in the r underscore n and the nt. So let's run it again, same variables, and see what happens. We also get the compound rate of 1.02 and the frequency of 8. And now let's finish it off. So here we've built the entire function. And if we use it here, we get compounded interest on $5,000 at 8% over two years, compounded four times a year, gives us $5,858.30. And if you want, you can go check that against a compound interest calculator on the internet and see that you'll get the same result. Now we could go back and try to clean this up and make it a little more concise, but I think the function works well as it is and it's easy to follow and understand. Now when you're testing one of these functions such as this, you want to make sure you're using data you'll know you know the correct answer to. That makes it a little bit easier or that you have a means of verifying it externally. So, some of the things that you should remember when you're building code and this is going to be applicable to projects you do for the class. Start with a working program. So, up here here was our working program. We had a name for our function we wanted to build. We defined it. We set up the syntax. We set up our parameters. And we made it return a zero. If we used it, it worked. It was very basic. And it didn't really do anything. But that's OK. Then we took it another step. We started adding in some parameters. And then in this case down here, you'll see that we've set up some variables to hold intermediate values along the way. And that's good. And we went ahead and we made it display and print those. So once we get it working, we may want to remove even more of the scaffolding. This is called our scaffolding. And we want to make it as concise and accurate as possible but we don't want it to be difficult to read. So keep those things in mind when you're working on your programming efforts. Next, we move on to the Boolean functions. Now, functions can return Boolean values, and this is often very convenient for hiding the complicated tests inside of functions. For example, here's a function called isDivisible. 
takes two parameters, x and y, and it's going to tell you whether or not the function 1x is divisible by y evenly. So it uses the modulus operator. So we have inside of our function an if statement, if x modulus operator y, meaning if x is divisible by y, the remainder and the remainder is equal to zero, then return true. If that is not the case, return false. So pretty straightforward and easy to use. In reality, we don't even need to use the if else here. We could simply write it very concisely as return x modulus operator y equal to zero, and it will get the same result, and it's more concise. And a recursion definition is similar to a circular definition in the sense that the definition contains a reference to the thing being defined. They use the factorial example to explain this. If you can write a recursive definition of something, you can write a Python program to evaluate it. And the first step is to decide what the parameters should be. So deciding on our parameters, well, let's use the factorial example here. We want to set up a function called factorial that will return the factorial of any given number. So we're passing one parameter. We're going to call it n. We need to add a basic conditional argument to this. So if n is equal to 0, return 1, because the factorial of 0 is 1. And then we know from, we've been told right up here, we know that the factorial of any number n is equal to n times n minus 1's factorial. So we can build that as well. We want to make this recursive. Find the factorial of n minus 1 and multiply it by n. So if n is equal to 0, return 1. Otherwise, you're going to use the recurse. We're going to set recurse equal to the factorial of n minus 1, whatever n was passed. We're going to set the result to n times the recurse. And then we're going to return the result. This should give us similar output to the countdown example. So let's try it out. Run that definition, and let's look at the factorial of 5 is 120. And you can also easily change the number. Let's put in 500, pardon me, and run that. You'll see you get a quite large number. Here's another example using the Fibonacci. You can translate it into Python. So here's the definition. And here we are defining a Fibonacci function. So if n is equal to 0, return 0. If n is equal to 1, return 1. Else, take the Fibonacci of n minus 1 plus the Fibonacci of n minus 2. Let's try the Fibonacci of 4. And it gives us 3, which is, in fact, accurate. We have other examples. Here's another factorial example. So what happens if we call factorial and give it 1.5 as an argument? Well, it gives us an error message because factorial is meant to be run on integers. So it runs into problems. It gives us a maximum recursion depth exceeded. And that looks like it's infinite. But the function has a base case of when n is equal to 0. So if n is not an integer, we miss the base case and re recurse forever. So to prevent that, we need to build in a function that will take care of these types of things. So we're going to add in if not is instant in an integer. Print out that factorial is only defined for integers. If it's less than 0, factorial is not defined for negative integers. And if n is 0, return 1. Otherwise, return n times the factorial of n minus 1. So this is we're adding in some error messages 
to prevent that maximum recursion depth exceeded error message. So let's create that. And now let's try this with Bob, a string. Factorial is only defined for integers, so it's saying, hey, this doesn't work. What about with a negative number? That one works. It says not defined for negative integers. If it's 0, we should get a 1. If it's 4, we should get a result. And here we get 24. So you can see, if you build in the isInstant function, if not isInstant, you can use these to build out error messages for your functions. So they're customized to work in the situations that you don't want somebody to use that function for. The chapter also talks a little bit about leap of faith. Now, recursion and using functions. When you use the built-in functions available in the math uh, module, you just kind of assume they work. It's a little bit of a leap of faith. Well, recursion works in a similar way. You just have to trust that it's going to work. In this chapter, we also talk a little bit about debugging. And there are three possibilities for a function problem if it's not working. One, there's something wrong with the arguments the function is getting. So a precondition has been violated. And that's what this first part of this definite or this function is about making sure that these preconditions aren't violated. Two, there's something wrong with the function. A post condition is violated. And three, there is something wrong with the return value or the way in which it is used. So when you're getting error messages and building functions, think about those things. Which one is it will help you resolve the error and get your program working? If you have any questions, please consult your professor.